Well, there was a huge renaissance of puppetry starting in the 1920s in America, and marionettes became huge right up until the war, uh, Second World War. And they were, uh, So they were part of vaudeville or music hall, or it was its own touring, game? Just touring shows, right? There was a man named Tony Sarg, who was a really famous illustrator of the day, who uh, brought puppets back to life and started doing shows on Broadway. And it, I think at his height, he had maybe seven touring companies that he would send around. There'd be wow. teams of four. And uh, Bill Baird, the man who did the Sound of Music puppets that I mentioned earlier, uh, worked for him for years, and they developed the Macy's balloons together. Those were Tony Sard. And uh, then Bill Baird hired me. So, you know, in terms of geeky puppet um, genealogy, uh, I consider Tony Sarg my grandfather. <laughs> you know, because he, the Sarg begat Baird, who begat Burkett in right. a weird way. And, you know, that's just geeky puppet boy stuff. But the, he started this, and he, he was the first one to make it uh, not secretive. So he would do articles in women's magazines about how to build marionettes and he published books on how to build puppets so suddenly everyone had access to information and people were making puppets at home and what kind of shows were they doing what kind of stories? Uh, treasure island rip van winkle uh, alice in wonderland they would do you know big full-on two-hour story shows with played in big theaters or small venues uh, or pretty pretty big theaters they would uh, you know all travel by all touring in those days was by train you know and they would set up in a church hall or a school hall or a local theater and they'd play the two shows and they'd put it back on the train and you would do that for seven months a company of four would, would and do those there. tours ever come up in Canada not that I know of no and what do you put the resurgence of puppets in the 20s? I mean, they, they come in and out of fashion, right? They do, yeah. Well, I think live entertainment, you know, the whole Chautauqua circuit and all of that stuff. There was, you know, there was a desire in the early part of the 20th century for culture, suddenly. You know, there were people on lecture uh, circuits, you know, giving um, talks to ladies' groups and things. So people were becoming uh, more interested in culture, I think, and suddenly, you know, the way uh, the Americas were shifting in terms of jobs and family and education, suddenly people had recreational time. And, you know, the hobby movement started in the 20s as well. So there were periodicals and magazines about different crafts and hobbies. So I think just society changed and, and people uh, wanted to expose themselves to more cultural activities and also more uh, recreational activities. I think it all just happened simultaneously. And was that part of vaudeville as well? Yes, yes there were people doing vaudeville with puppets. Yeah. Would they be marionettes or hand puppets? or A the... lot of marionettes. Marionettes dominated uh, right up until the 50s pretty much. Yeah. And then of course the great killer of that entire renaissance happened television. And puppets were on television because they were cheap and they were good babysitters and in the public mindset puppets were for children again. Yep. You know, and they were singing songs about sharing and eating your broccoli and killing time, you know. So, um, you know, I had I been working in the 30s and 40s, I would have had a big community and a big wave of doing mm -hmm. traditional marionette shows. But by the time I started doing theater of marionettes, you know, I was pretty much back to square one of puppets are for kids. Yep. I mean, that's, I mean, my first introduction to the Ronnie Burkett idea of, of puppetry and, and was, well, what's this about? I thought it was a children's venue. Mm -hmm. And it took me too many years, you know, from the knee to your work to go, no, no, this is well, an old form. That and there was someone working <clears throat> before me in this country who, who started to change things, and that was Felix Merck, of course, yep. because he was doing shows at the NAC and at Theatre Calgary and doing shows like Happy End and Wojciech and, and uh, uh, other shows. And, and his work was, you know, stylistically very bold with manipulators in full view doing, you know, serious work. Um, so I, I honestly, I didn't know him. I certainly knew of him, and I know more about him since, um, since he's passed away, but he, he definitely started putting the crowbar in the theater door to let me in, because I didn't think I would ever get in the real theater. Right. That's not what you're told when you're a little puppet boy. You know, you live in the puppet ghetto, 
and you do school tours and you play parks and you do shopping malls and private parties and maybe if you if you have a body show you do nightclubs maybe but um, you know the theater in this country let me in and let me stay that, that that was a bigger dream come true than I can tell you because that's the kind of fantasy you have as a child as a puppeteer where you think oh I can't say that out loud because that'll never happen um, so history of puppetry, I mean, these were my father's puppets. So can you talk to me about... Oh my gosh. Can you talk to me about these guys? I'll give you all three of them. Whoa, who and made these? I presume that my grandfather bought those for his kids when he was, you know, either in, I don't know, New York or Europe, and he brought them home and my father played with them. So Wow. It's, um, so you've got, a, this looks like a policeman. Yeah. He had a stick. I remember as a child, he had a stick. Yeah, it looks a little dramatic here, don't you think? So, but you know, Punch and Judy, and this is obviously the devil. The um, devil. And this is either supposed to be Punch. It looks a bit punchish, or it could be Joey the Clown. These are fantastic. You know, Punch exists in pretty much every culture, right? Um, in uh, and in who Germany, is Punch? who is Punch? Mr. Punch from Punch and Judy uh, exists in. Uh, in Turkey as Karagyaz, and I probably mispronounced that. Um, uh, in, he exists in Iran, he exists in Germany as Kasparol, he exists in Italy. So these, these stock characters that grew out of sort of the Commedia uh, exist, you know, in Turkey he's a shadow puppet character. But it's the same formula of sort of an everyman ne'er-do-well who um, is not great to his wife or his child and, you know, tricks everybody and hangs the hangman and beats up the police officer. But it's in many cultures you'll find the character of Mr. Punch from Punch and Judy. So these are obviously either German or English uh, versions of that. Oh, they're great. And I'm guessing from the German policeman that it must be well. It is twenties. It is 30s, looking a little right? Kaiserish. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because those helmets then disappeared. <laughs> um, certainly by the thirties, those helmets had disappeared. Yeah. No, these guys. <laughs> these are the treasures. Devil? You know that, eh? You know that. Well. Yeah. They were old. They were old and beaten up and they were missing bits and pieces. And I was doing a, a road to Avonlea, and I thought as my character, I'd come back from a trip and I would bring some presents to my children. So because it was set in the early 1900s, I brought these puppets on mm. set and I said, you know, should we use these as props? And there was an old prop maker there, an Italian man, mm. who was old, old, old. He, he looked and he said, give them to me. I'll fix them. Mm. And he spent a day rebuilding them, repainting them, and I'm nice. totally grateful to him. Yeah. The devil, where does the devil come in here? Well, you know, Punch is the great everyman character, and so he beats the devil, literally. He beats him with his little um, stick, and, uh, and that was the appeal of Mr. Punch, is that he could rise above the devil and the law and the clergy. You know, they, the Punch and Judy showmen of several hundred years ago were all run out of town because they would set up in a square in town, and they would take on politicians, the clergy, everything, the devil. They would take on everything, and they were usually run out of town because of what they were saying. This was before newspapers and, and radio and all of that stuff, you know, so people were getting their jollies and their news off of performers in, in the village square. So I, I have a great affection for Punch and Judy. Uh, not, not the politically correct versions that have to be done now, because you actually can't beat your wife with a stick and throw your baby out the window. <laughs> even though it's fantastic when you see a guy do a real Punch and Judy show. Right. It's so exuberant and it's so fun. It's like Bugs Bunny to me, right? Right. Um, if you think he really is beating his wife, then, you know, it takes the fun out of it. But um, he beats everybody. And uh, <laughs> I've seen feminist Punch and Judys that don't really work. So my advice is just don't do Punch and Judy, you know, just read about it. But. Um, but they well, it's also the Taming of the Shrew. What do you do with the last scene of the Taming of the Shrew? Exactly. Where the shrew is tamed, what do you do? Yeah. Well, well there's that classic question, right? Uh, do you do theater the way it's written to be done, or do you make it a museum piece, or do you constantly update it? You know, that's, a, that's an ongoing question. You know, I did a Punch and Judy show with marionettes uh, as a theater of marionette show years ago called The Punch Club. 
Uh, and it was a, it started off as a Punch and Judy show, and, and they were a tired old troupe, and then the, the bottom of the hand puppet stage opened up, and it was backstage, and they were all seen as marionettes. So Mr. Punch was played by Neville Newton, and his wife, Dottie Fig Newton, and wow. you know there was the ingenue who played Pretty Polly, but she was in spandex backstage. Um, uh, it was very, and then what happened is, uh, a feminist with an Uzi storms the theater. Bettina Tofu comes in, <laughs> and she's there to kill Mr. Punch or Neville Newton for playing this character. And it was all funny and musical, but it was ultimately about uh, when you use the same tactics as the person you see as an aggressor, do you not become the aggressor? That was the whole thing. So she storms in to get things her way with an Uzi and ends up becoming part of the new Punch and Judy show. It was very silly and funny, but... That was the only way I could touch Punch and Judy.